everybody knows the voice liberation sigh. Can I hear it? Uh, 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 um, hmm. So for the one who doesn't know it yet, we have the head side, the worry side. Then we have the liberation side. <sighs> mm. okay. Feel free to do this anytime during the whole week or during your whole life. It's okay. <sighs> mm. And I have the honor to open up for you guys with a song. And this is kind of a new song. It's not on The Light Has Come. It will be on my next album. And I think it describes very well um, why we came to the Course. Nobody really came to the Course because they were super, super happy. We came to the Course because we knew there's something missing here. There's, there got to be another way. And this song is about that, and it's called Homesick. so long that I don't even know where I came from and where I truly belong You say I'm not really and that there's nothing to fear and I still feel like all of this is real Oh, I'm home, but I'm homesick I'm feeling abandoned Where is your love? Now that I need it I'm home, but I'm homesick Say. 
come to me of my true home. Take me back to where I came from. Oh, I'm home, but I'm homesick. I'm feeling abandoned. Where is from 
this perhaps anxiousness or what's going to happen or what did I sign up for? Ah, waking up is scary. <laughs> Start with that sign. You just can just keep your eyes closed for now if it feels comfortable. And just take in with that sign everything that you're feeling. All your thoughts. They can just be there and just ask them, you know, like how do you sound? So we start by making that sign a bit longer. So something like this.
be on now. Testing. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for coming. I've been very excited about this and uh, so honored to be here with all of you. And. Uh, song is called Close to You, um, and the second one is Into the Mystic, and uh, both of these songs are from my album of Divine Essence. Longing to be 
Lovely. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you so much for coming. It's going to be an amazing week, I think, for all of us. And just before I came up, I was reminded when Emily was talking about make your prayer, make your prayer for this week, how powerful our mind is. Because there was a time when uh, Frances was, had discovered A Course in Miracles and she was teaching a class. It was a meetup group, A Course in Miracles meetup group in Sydney. And she heard about me through our friend Jason, I think, at her group. And then she came for one week, like all of you are doing, to meet and go through the same experience that you're all going to have for one week in Noosa. And maybe you can share your heart opened so much that it changed the course and the direction of our whole life. And nothing was ever the same. I actually met David um, in February and in Sydney, Australia. He came, we did a gathering, and he said, Come to my one week NUSA retreat. And I said, when is that? He said, in two months. Seven day retreat in two months time. And I said, no, that's, no, I can't go in two months, I'm not ready. It feels so scary to go to a retreat of seven days. So I waited for a whole year until the next year he came to Australia in the same location. And that, by that time, I was ready. So it's, it takes, you know, it takes the mind to feel, oh my God, I'm ready for this. Somehow, the mind feels when it's ready. And then when I went, I watched already about a year of David's video, YouTube videos, and still nothing really prepared me for the experience, because no matter how much we absorb in words and in, in teaching, filter through it, a mind that processes based on its own frame of understanding. And, and yet that, that whole week, it was purely experiential. You know, there was a lot of um, teaching, but also a lot of practices and sharing the mind, sharing the thoughts with all these many companions who came with me. And that was such a profound experience, so mystical. So at the end of the seven days, I was ready to leave my life as I knew it, to completely change the direction of my life. But that actually came after an experience not come from, you know, from any kind of understanding through an intellectual mind. So I just feel, yeah, this is so precious, so, so, so precious. And the fact that you're already so ready to be here, you know, however long the journey, you know, had been till this point, however much ob many obstacles that you've come through, but here you are, and I feel, I really feel to say that this, on this spiritual awakening journey, we really overestimate our own effort and underestimate the spirit's effort. And I feel so certain that you have gone through the hard part. When you are here, your part is, is done. <laughs> and the rest of the week, we are just together and hand over our whole mind to the spirit. That's all that we're here to do. And we're going to just join to watch how healing happens. 
It's that powerful. Talk about moving mountains. That's a little bit. Uh, I remember when I was listening to it, I was sitting up in my bed. I just fell over backwards onto my bed when I heard that answer. Because it was so overwhelming at how powerful our mind is and how powerful our thoughts are. He even used in miscreation to, to make a projected world of time and space, there's still power in that mind. And to me, everything is a collection of ideas. Everything is an idea of mine. I have enjoyed over these last 33 years uh, the Course in Miracles just having this experience so deeply that miracles are collaborative and, and everything is a collection of ideas. I was just praying today and I was just thinking about all the orchestrations, all the collaborations that went into this shared experience that we're all having right now. And uh, thinking of Monique, where's Monique? I was thinking of me, and I was thinking of Coase, and I was thinking of Doris, and I was thinking of our dinner at that little hotel restaurant downtown, and sharing these ideas of wouldn't it be nice? And Coase was saying, Oh, I think you could do I, I think you could do it. I think he was just sharing it, a twinkle in his eye, and there it is. It's all a collaboration. All the spirit orchestrating everything, and we have the fun of watching it, of experiencing it, how loved we are that everything is orchestrated for our awakening. We don't have to do this in a personal way, we don't have to personally figure it out. We just have to be willing, we just have to trust. And I think also the word that was coming to mind, Francis and I talked earlier today about was faith. When the Course first came into my life, I was, my heart exploded, I felt these waves of love uh, just pouring over me, and yet I thought, oh my God, what is this life going to be? What will become of me? If I give myself over to Jesus in this course, what will become of me? And it's actually as if all these symbols of the world that, that seem to have our attention are used as a backdrop for this huge expansion of faith. Because I can see now, in retrospect, Every step along the way was like Jesus saying, trust me and, and expanding my faith beyond what I could even imagine. I didn't imagine the, the parable of David, and I know you didn't imagine the parable of Francis going that way. We had very different seeming lives in the world when we got into this, and then all of a sudden this expansion of faith has carried us really unfathomable ways that we didn't plan. It, had, it didn't have anything to do with our previous uh, plans of this life. It's just amazing. Even sitting here with all of you, it's like this is, it's such a heartfelt experience, but it has there, it wasn't something that I, I could have conceived of when the Course came into my life. If somebody had showed me a video of this, I would have either laughed at them and said, you've got the wrong person, all right, that looks a little bit like David, but that is not, or it would have been total fear and disbelief, like that would have scared me if I would seen the motion picture of how the life would go. So it's been like an expansion of faith. Really. Yeah. And we really have to rely on ourselves. 
something that has really known of this realm of time space. I remember at first I was I studied the course for many years before I met David, and I somehow never really get that the essence of the course is to follow the Holy Spirit. Somehow it just never comes through. It's all about the ego and analyzing the ego and understanding, and I think that that is that has been very very helpful. And yet. When I went to the, my first retreat and started to 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 go on this mind training and really accept, okay, I'm just gonna do it, whatever it takes, because I have to find out what Jesus promises in the course is true, and I don't know what it's gonna take, and I don't care what it's gonna take, because at the end of the day, I want to know whether it's true or not. So then I remember when I came to the Miracles community and I first heard about this concept or this talk that we are going to pray and follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I was like, what? <laughs> and what is that? What, how, how do I know I even hear that? And what is the benefit of following the Holy Spirit? I was the one who asked the most questions around this guidance thing because it feels so far from from my background and from how I understood the world, how the world operates. So that was a, a very interesting start. But I would say that in the past 10 years, it was a full-time devotion in this direction. You know, it's like little by little, giving over more and more decisions of my life to be guided, little by little. And that just become like a wash of the mind. And I have to say, the result of it is nothing I have expected. You know, the result of just listen and follow the guidance, first of all, is to be convinced that we are guided. And first of all, I wasn't even convinced of that. So to, to listen and follow, gradually I grew to become convinced of that. And in following his voice, I started to know him. Because the voice and the direction started to open me up to something that is way beyond, way beyond. And that is purely experiential. So that's what I really feel today, even I was telling David, I said after the 300 and Five lessons in a course of miracles in the epilogue. There's maybe four paragraphs. That's that's the instruction that we were given how to move forward. And that that whole section does have one message. I put you in his hands now. And he will direct you in everything. He knows how to resolve all pain all problems and all the answers will be given you whenever a choice is needed. That's the essence of how to move forward. After studying, just studying, this is really the instruction of how to how to use the course and how to live in such a way that we know we become truly living, truly become understanding who Holy Spirit is, but really who we are, who the source is through living it. So, yeah, so I think today is just, first of all, I feel even just how this whole retreat is opened, you know, that is 
song and the voice of liberation, I, we just go right into it. The spirit is just saying, let's be free, let's just, you know, get loose. It's not, it's not very hard if you give it to me. And I will, I will make you laugh. I will make you smile. And I will make you relax. But let this journey just be a journey. And let these seven days be seven days that we give our trust, give our prayers, our minds to the Spirit, and find out for ourselves. So just feel like, yeah, this is truly become very simple and very single focused. That's all we do in our lives. And when we put up a retreat up, that's exactly what we do. Spirit show us. And every single day, every single session, every single decision, encounter, is completely orchestrated that way. So it's just very, very relaxing for the mind. Yes, it's such a huge opportunity to fully give yourself over to just a prayer for healing. Because for many, many centuries in, in humankind and in human history, there really wasn't much of an awareness. I think in some very deep esoteric tribes there was a bit, but there wasn't generally speaking, an awareness of the unconscious mind. You know, that's why all these religions have the, here's what you do to get to heaven, here's what you don't do to get to heaven. Or maybe you call it nirvana, or call it whatever you want, paradise. But it was all the behaviors. Do these things, make it. If you don't do these things, okay, you're not going to make it. Do these the do's and the don'ts. What's wrong with do's and don'ts? Why does time keep going on when everybody tries to follow all the do's and don'ts with much difficulty? It's because the solution of waking up is not to do with behavior. Behavior is an effect. Behavior is a projection. And the way Jesus teaches us in the Course, he says, Seek not to change the world, because the world is an effect. The world is beyond change. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. The ego is a belief in the mind. That's where you have to change your thinking. You have to change your belief system from one of hatred and guilt and anger and fear to one of forgiveness. We have to shift our belief system. We have to we have to replace all of our grievances and attack thoughts with with loving thoughts. So we need a mind overhaul. The behavior is not going to cut it one way or the other. All that is is judgments projected as if they're in an external world. And how many of us, you know, have grown up trying to be the good girl and the good boy? do the right things, to please our parents, to please society, to do the right behaviors so we'll be accepted, so we'll be loved. Jesus is basically telling us, if you're putting your attention onto behaviors, it's going to be futile. Because again, you're trying to change effects without even knowing of their unconscious cause. The ego has projected these bodies and all these behaviors and these planets and spheres and all of time and space as a giant mask covering over who you really are. Or if we go back to the Bible in Genesis, you know, the whole story of Adam and Eve, you know, they, you read through it and it's like, and, and then they knew that they were naked and they covered themselves. Okay. The fig leaf comes in to cover those private parts. Well, what if all of time and space is a giant cosmic fig leaf? <laughs> We've got a fig leaf for the mind. 
because we were so embarrassed at the belief that we could separate from God. We were so shocked from the belief that we could separate from our Creator that we pushed it out of awareness and we made a, a cosmic time-space fig leaf to cover us. Cover it up. Oops. Big problem. We weren't supposed to separate from God. We'll get the fig leaf quick. Let's get a big one. <laughs> it's a big boo-boo, so let's have a big, <laughs> a big covering to cover it up. And, and let's make it so big that we will forget all about it. You know, we'll get so distracted in that. So, in one sense, like Francis was saying, it's going to take devotion. Jesus tells us that this world of time and space is learned. He says, you have overlearned an impossible idea. You, and you didn't even stop to ponder why you were learning this cosmic fig leaf. You didn't even ponder to say, is this really the right direction? Should I keep learning and overlearning error and learning and overlearning error? Winding my sleeping mind deeper and deeper into darkness and then just trying to distract away from this original error, what they call the original sin, the original error, the belief you could separate from God. And now we have to unwind. We have to go in the other direction. Now to put this in context, you know, Jesus seemed to appear 2,000 years ago, and we have the Gospels, and we have the Arantia book, and the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. We have, we have a number of teachings that have come through, but with the Course, it's so clear, it's like razor sharp metaphysics. I mean, it's like if you were in a jungle and you, had, you were wrapped up in the vines, and you needed to escape the vines, you would want something that's razor sharp so you could get, cut these vines off of your limbs and free yourself from the jungle. You have stumbled upon, we have all stumbled upon, of course, miracles. It's a reflection of our desire to wake up, and the metaphysics in this are razor sharp. This is from an awakened mind. Hallelujah, that we, in this context of our holographic dream, that we've got this book that is like razor sharp. But even though the metaphysics are razor sharp, if you don't have the willingness to practice it, if you don't have the willingness to dive in, if you don't have the willingness to grab that sharp tool and start cutting it, and letting the Holy Spirit, Jesus, guide you, even that razor-sharp tool won't help you. Because the dream of darkness is so thick, the fog is so thick, that even if you had the brightest light with that thick fog, you're still going to have to take steps in and through the darkness to the light. You're going to have to go through that fog. So, I feel like when we come to this experience of this, this week-long retreat, this is really our mind's opportunity to really exercise faith. To say, whatever, however I seem to get here, I'm going to bring my faith and I'm going to give it to Jesus and the Holy Spirit to really show me the way. Not to think that I know the way through past learning. The one thing that will, that will be used by the ego to guard you against opening your heart, to guard you against diving in, to guard you against pouring your willingness in and, and, and giving it your best effort, is the belief that you already know something. It will be, the ego will say, use your past learning and try to judge this experience based on your past learning. That's how the ego tries to keep us away from a total change of mind, which we need. It's just by telling us, well, you're, you're not totally uh, 
clueless, I mean, you, you, you know certain things, and you do have a contribution to make in this awakening, and the Spirit is like saying, if you want to really learn faith, you're going to have to learn how to listen within, how to trust, and how to follow the guidance and the instructions that come. Let me give you some examples of that. Francis was talking about, she grew up, she, she didn't hear anything about hearing the Holy Spirit. She grew up in Beijing, China, communist China, and she grows up in Beijing, and how many of you, when you were growing up in your lives, had, I'm just going to throw out a name, had an experience of the Beatles? Anybody in here experience anything to do with the Beatles? <laughs> Anybody not <laughs> have an experience with the Beatles? Francis grew up, she didn't know of the Beatles. No. And it wasn't too many years ago, I took her to see this movie called Eight Days a Week. Yeah. That, that beautiful movie, The Beatles. And I sat next to Francis in this theater, this old theater in Salt Lake City, and I just looked over at her, and she just had tears, the whole movie. Tears streaming down her face. Because she got to feel through the movie the impact of the Beatles. <laughs> Two hours of Beatle mania <laughs> all over the world. In fact, I was following the tours. They made it to Tokyo. That was not, it wasn't too far. But you were in Beijing. <laughs> and they were going wild in Tokyo, but not in Beijing. And so, to me, that was an example of how the Holy Spirit used music in particular the Beatles, the Fab Four, to reach Francis's heart with so much love that she just cried the whole movie. She was just speechless at the love from the Beatles that came through. And in my case, you know, I, I grew up and for me religion seemed kind of dry. I, I was forced to go to church, I kind of sat through sermons, and I was the, I was the teenager looking out the window at the birds. I was probably more like Francisco, Francisco, St. Francis, looking at the birds, and pretty bored. And then, as I grew up into my teens and twenties, two things that I disliked the most about this world was traveling and speaking. <laughs> Those are the two things that I could not stand. I was voted most quiet in my senior class, uh, and I thought traveling was like these family vacations where the United States is a big country, and when you drive across, <laughs> I was very bored. I just had a huge dislike of travel and a huge hesitation and fear and embarrassment around speaking. That's just regular speaking, not even mention public speaking. <laughs> um, so what I'm saying by this, her growing up, she didn't know of, she didn't have any experience with Beatles until wham, it hit her in that two hour movie. And I had really no joyful, gleeful experience around travel or speaking. It was more of a drudgery uh, for me. And I give you those examples because the Holy Spirit has to use things in such a new way that your faith will expand. That's why when you start practicing the Course, oftentimes the guidance you get is towards something that you have a major hesitation. It may say, call so-and-so, or I want you to go meet with so-and-so, and you're like, I don't even like so-and-so. Why would I want to meet them? And Jesus is like, yeah, that's why you've got to trust me. Your faith is only going to expand if you follow, if you 
because I know the way. And, and I feel like, in one sense, it's a way of stretching us, it's a way of opening us up, it's a way of humbling us. I feel like we have to be given things to do, we have to be sent on missions, we have to be used in collaboration that we may not at first consider helpful or valuable, but it's a way of washing away our belief in the past. It's a way of lifting us up and taking us in a new direction so our hearts can open and we can truly expand. And as I said, neither of us would have predicted these lives or how we were used in the plan of awakening because it seems to be so different, so beyond anything that we could ever imagine. That's how you go through the darkness to the light, is you have to go through it with faith. You have to go through it with that attitude of, use me, show me. I will step back and let you lead the way. I do not know my own best interest. Isn't that amazing at the beginning of the workbook of, of A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, in no situation do you perceive your best interest. He doesn't say some. He doesn't say only in rare cases. <laughs> only in rare cases do you perceive your own best interest. I mean, for most people, the first time they read that in the workbook lessons, there's usually like, like some kind of offense. Like, what did you just say? In no situation? Do you know how many millions and trillions of situations I go through in a lifetime and you're telling me I've got zero? I have not had a single situation in which I knew my own best interest? I'm over 20 trillion and I haven't even had one. What does Jesus mean by this? Well, he goes on in the next lesson to say, everything is for your own best interest. Everything. <laughs> That's even more offensive. <laughs> it's okay, you tell me first that no situation do I have no, my own best interest, and now you're telling me the next one, everything is for your own best interest. Everything. He says this again, he says, all things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. That must mean that there's everything that seems to be occurring is in divine order. And he's saying you can choose to come on up here above the battleground with the Holy Spirit in me and see the divine order in everything, that nothing is out of place that nothing has ever been out of place, just misperceived it, or you can stick with your egoic human perceptions and think you know, oh, that was a good day, that was a pretty good day, things went my way there in the morning, I was having a real good morning there, until the afternoon hit, <laughs> and then all hell broke loose, and then now you tell me everything's for my own best interest. Now, when you really read this, you know, the ego will be offended by these teachings. The ego will be very offended by these teachings from Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees and the, and the rulers of the day, particularly the religious leaders, were very offended by Jesus, even though he only offered love. All of his teachings were just offering love and, and Many people were bitterly offended by the teachings. And Jesus, it, it even says, many bitter idols have been made of one who, who only offered a blessing and only offered love. So that's one of the things we're going to explore this week, is that when we talk about situations, all of us 
have a meaning that comes to mind when we think of a situation. We could even think of a group of 180 people sitting in a barn. This is the fanciest barn I've ever seen. <laughs> but if we think of 180 people sitting in a barn as this is a situation, right? We have dining situation, walking through the ground situation. We're in the sitting together in the barn situation. Okay. And remember what Jesus told us, in no situation, that means in this sitting in the barn situation, we do not receive our own best interest. Why? Why don't we? We seem to do a pretty good job to get here and I'm having fun. But why? It's because the sleeping mind is addicted to situational thinking. God doesn't think in terms of situations. God is a God of abstract love, and we're talking about egoic situational thinking. He even tells us that you need to practice with the lessons in all the situations, and he says, try not to make any exceptions so you can transfer the training. Because, why? Why do I need to transfer the training? Why do I need to take this purpose you're giving me of forgiveness and transfer it in all these separate situations? It's because, because at present, he says, you, you have a very limited perception, a very limited way of thinking, and a very limited way of looking at the world. And these early lessons are cleared the way for a much broader understanding that is beyond these situations. Isn't that wonderful? He's telling us we're thinking very small in terms of these situations. But there is a broader perception, there is another way of looking at the world, and a far broader understanding that you now possess. He's telling us in the early lessons, just trust me, just take my hand, just practice these lessons, and do the best that you can with them, and transfer the training as best as you can without making exceptions, and then as we go deeper into this workbook, you're going to find that you're going to have more expansive experiences, even broader expanses of your awareness. You could even say at times even mystical, expansive experiences that are far beyond anything that you ever experienced in your typical perception daily life of situations. Another thing that God doesn't perceive is God doesn't see separate situations and God doesn't see status. What is your status? Anybody ever come up to you and say, what is your relationship status? Are you are you single? Are you married? Now Facebook is like four or five, six, you know, I have open, open uh, I mean, there's all these different statuses, but God doesn't think in terms of status. God's not thinking, what is your relationship status? And what is your economic status? In fact, what is your cultural status? God doesn't think in terms of race. God doesn't think in terms of, of marital status. It doesn't think in terms of cultural status. It doesn't think, oh yeah, Italian and German and American and Russian. And another thing, God doesn't think in terms of categories. God doesn't know categories. Now we're starting to understand why we don't see our own best interests. How many of our thoughts as we go through the day are about category, Comparisons, status, what's your status? Are you online? What's your Facebook status? What's your, what's your relationship status? 
Isn't that a lot of thoughts going through about our relationship status, how good our primary relationships are? There's a lot of status thoughts in there, and there's also a lot of categories. You know, we have cultural categories, we have political categories, all different types of categories. Food categories, exercise categories, body categories. Fat, skinny, tall, short. You know, there's all these categories. So it starts to become pretty obvious why we don't perceive our own best interests is because God created us as a pure spiritual being of love and light, and the ego has turned us into like statisticians to com always comparing, always contrasting, always concerned about the body, about the condition of the body, about the shape of the body, about body's needs. It makes all kinds of hierarchies and categories up. It's a giant menagerie of what Shakespeare calls much ado about nothing. Our mind is, is addicted to this kind of thinking. It's addicted. And Lesson 23 of the Course is saying, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. These attack thoughts aren't just angry thoughts. They're categories, comparisons, preferences, hierarchies. They're statuses. All of these things I'm just talking about, those are the attack thoughts. It's no wonder the Buddha said, empty your mind. Because Buddha was right on the right track. He was, he was zooming in to the toward the Christ nature. He, was, he wrote and told us all about the void. And Jesus is saying, yeah, empty your mind of everything you think you think, think you know, less than 189, you've got this hold on to nothing. Do not bring with you one thought to pass this top. One the least you ever learned before from anything. Forget this world, forget this course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. He's taking us through the void and into what? The kingdom of heaven. He's articulating the kingdom of heaven. He's telling us all about home, like that song. I really want to go home. What about Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, clicking to her ruby slippers over and over and over? There's no place like home. Glinda the Good Witch, you always had the power to go home. Yeah, all these movies are telling us the same thing, the songs are telling us, and yet Jesus Christ is articulating the kingdom of heaven. In the Bible, it says the kingdom of heaven is within you. In the Course, Jesus says, the word within is actually unnecessary. The kingdom of heaven is you. That's as direct as it gets. Is you. Far from some place up in the, in the celestial realm, far from even within, it is actually who you are. The kingdom of heaven is synonymous with your Christ nature, with the pure idea of Christ, a perfect idea and a perfect creator. You are an idea in the mind of God. So here we are. What an opportunity we have at the Inch of the Kingdom retreat to just begin to be aware of the much to do about nothing and to notice where we think that the nothing is something. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where you really get a chance to unplug from the ego, is when you just notice some thought in your mind, some category, some judgment, some preference, some nuance that you still want to be right about. Don't want to 
hold on to to protect. That's really where you're getting to the point of release. Surrender is, is not a bad word. Surrender is a, is a wonderful experience. I, I highly recommend surrender. <laughs> I mean, really. When I was growing up, you know, my mother was a history teacher and had to go to the history class and study about all the wars and, and who's fighting who, and then finally one as the surrender. And I thought, oh, surrender is the loser. Borrow a word from Trump, loser. So the, one, the, the ones that surrender are the losers. But actually now I've come to see that I think surrender is wonderful. Particularly when you look at surrender, surrendering the, the belief that you need to be right. Or surrendering the idea that you know something. When heaven is knowledge, and, and in the realm of perception, there's no way, we, we are clueless. We may think we've got categories and status and and all kinds, know all kinds of important things. We have lots of education. I had 10 years of university studying myself. Jesus is like, ah, we've got so much work to do here. <laughs> you just couldn't have stopped. You know, I, I was trying to get your attention at five years, but you had to go on and go more, and, and then bread school on top, and then but finally, you know, I got you. And then now we got to go in the other direction. Unlearn it all. But we're going to do this in a sense of, of joy. That's what we're going to do. We're doing it together. It can be fun. It can be playful. You can start to realize it's, 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 it's actually joyful to surrender. It's not like pulling teeth or, or struggling. It's actually joyful to finally put the car in reverse. <laughs> After going forward, thinking you're going forward, it's nice to, to step back. So I'm, I'm thrilled. I think we have these seats up front for the questions. And, and I do like to do this thing uh, where if you've got something and you come to the session and you feel like you're just going to burst, like, you have been cultivating something over the night, and, and we will do this thing where this can come up and just, we sit side by side, and we'll just go into it together, we'll go into the pot. And so that's what Emily was talking about. If, if, if you're really feeling something, if you were at work for today, if somebody is really but you, know, you were saying emotionally, if they have something that is very like, burning on their heart, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think just to also just really trust, like Emily was talking about, trust the process, because when things come up and you're feeling this shake and you want to ask, you want to say something, it's not just for yourself. And you're situation or your problem that you still think is your own is actually for the whole universe because our minds are connected. And um, many years, I just was thinking many years ago, um, I did a silent retreat in Australia, three weeks of pure silence. And throughout the, the three weeks, it was pretty strict that nobody talked to each other. And I was uh, the only one that people come to me to have one-on-ones. And I got to see everybody's problem on the day are the same, exactly the same. They don't know. The next day, suddenly it becomes this thing. And everybody thinks it's their own problem. But it's so interesting to watch, you know, from this angle. So I just, yeah, I just want to invite you to to trust this week and trust the process and trust the spirit. We don't have 180 Holy Spirit that's gonna guide us.
separately to do separate things. There's one Holy Spirit because there's only one mind. And through just following the same spirit, we're going to come back gradually to this awareness that they're not even separate bodies and separate people. But the benefit to know up front that there is only one Holy Spirit is because in that way we can truly relax in trusting, you know, we're here together, we're here unified in one purpose. So even if I don't hear something because the purpose was so focused and devoted and we're holding that prayer in our hearts so firmly, we will hear what is guided. So the guidance is not going to be missed at all. It's weak. And we can all just relax knowing that Spirit is going to guide us through step by step every day, even who is to share, what issues to be talked about, what is coming up is completely being guided. And it's for the mind to open up together, for the mind to come back to this place of, of oneness together. So that's where we can truly relax, because we're not relying on our own effort. I have to hear the Holy Spirit today, otherwise I will fail and be here. I mean. So that's not, not something that we need to even concern or worry about. So. And it's something that you could really cultivate in the sense that, that we do. For us, guidance is not a topic. Guidance is everything. We were talking today, or maybe it was yesterday, about the epilogue of The Course of Miracles. And the epilogue is basically, you reach that point where he's saying, Basically, there are no further lessons. Uh, from this point on, let the Holy Spirit guide you in all of your learning. And the epilogue doesn't say, this is a very difficult course, you will read this course for the next five decades and still shaking your head and scratching your head. The epilogue does not say, you have reached the end of this time through the workbook, but now we want you to do this 25 more times uh, and continue to repeat this workbook over and over and over. It doesn't, no, the epilogue doesn't say this. It says, this is the end of the lessons. Henceforth, follow the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you really look at the last five lessons, of the workbook is basically saying, you know, this holy instant what I give to you, be you in charge, for I would but follow. Jesus is weaning us off the workbook, actually, at the end of the workbook. And if you read the, if you read those lessons, really look at what he's saying, and you look at that epilogue, he's like saying, I want you to really have faith in me. Like, this isn't going to be like the scribes and the Pharisees where you just sit around and, you know, and you don't want to follow my instructions. So you make a second edition of the course. You get a little bored there, you make a third edition, still no fourth, no fifth edition. No, he's not encouraging us to be like the scribes and the Pharisees. He wants us to move into an experience of oneness, and at first of being the dreamer of the dream, and of forgiving the dream. So, that's one of the things that's important for us, is, is for us, guidance of the Holy Spirit is not like a topic among topics. Like, you know, where you go to a lecture and there's all these topics, relationships, and, and this and this and guidance and it's weak for us the trust and the guidance go together and the guidance is absolutely central because really the Course in Miracles is nothing more than a book to put you in touch 
with your internal teacher. He wants you to be able to, instead of using the training wheels on your little bicycle, your little tassels and everything, he wants you to actually take the training wheels off and, and to pedal and to go with that bicycle and go and go and go and, and go on an adventure with that bicycle.
So you don't think I had to re let go of that. Even when Jesus said at one point on my travels, he said, now I want, I've been speaking to you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for following. Now we're going to try with one more thing. What more? I mean, and he said, I want to speak through you. And that took another leap of faith, another stretch to go into that. But that's the kind of steps that we're going to take. And we do have lots of parables to share from our, our life, parables of, of un, it's really undoing the self-concept. You know, we have this, this personality self, Mav, that who we believe we are. And then it starts to crumble sometimes, it starts to unravel at times, it starts to dismantle at times, and this can be very threatening if, if it's who you believe you are, uh, to have these kind of unraveling, dismantling experiences but it's, it's almost like the Humpty Dumpty story where, where the big A falls off the, falls off the wall and cracks into all these pieces. And then all the king's horses and all the king's men put, put Humpty back together again. It's, it's like we're going to be given more expansive self-concepts. We're not going to have anything shattered or ripped away from us, but the more our faith expands and the more willing we are to listen and follow, our seeming self-concept will undergo changes. The Holy Spirit will take us step by step in more of a gradual progression toward who we are, toward the Christ. You can even think of Eckhart Tolle told the park bench experience, you know, he was, he had such a piercing of the veil, he had such a fast mystical experience that it took him a long time to come back, to come back to function, what he would call functioning in the world, because the vastness of the holy instant, the vastness of that huge experience of who we really are, is so radically different from this tiny little self-concept that the ego made and has tried to convince us is who we are. So that's why also my prayer is that that you become more connected to that intuition, that guidance within, and also you start to have through through experiences of the voice liberation of the experientials of, of our talks and, and our chats, of, of the music that comes through, that you'll have a, a much broader experience of, of yourself. You'll perceive yourself in more of an expansive, heart open way than when you came. And that will be part of the convincing that you are so much more than you think you are, than you believe you are. But I think it's going to be a great, great, great week. I'm very excited. I felt so much joy and synergy just coming here because of the, the, the reception, the receptivity. You're saying that too before we came here. It's almost like a, a reunion, family reunion. And the feeling after I, I walk over here, many of you guys are walking to my dinner, and I just had so many of you that I thought, wow, it's so like family reunion. Nothing more, but just come here to be together. And in a very, very holy and deep purpose, let's, let's just trust this, this deep purpose that brought you over here, brought us over here. It's very, very deep. And a lot of the times we think, oh, that's, we have to do so much on top of our pure heart. But really, in this journey, it's just the desire decides absolutely everything, determines everything. And everything that seemed to happen in the 
form, they're all involuntary, you know, they're all orchestrated by this desire underneath. And we all have a, this deep burning desire to know the truth. So I feel like this, yeah, I feel like it's already done somehow in my mind. Already done. And the other thing I want to mention too is um, people say that I get really excited, really animated with movies. Uh, I came here a little bit over three years ago. Some of you were with me. We went, we were off up to the north, been here in Holland. Uh, we had about 57 of us for five days. And the first first two or two and a half days, you know, we were we were starting to go deeper and we were cautiously taking our steps into the mind. Then I got the guidance to show these two movies. And that just blew the lid off. I mean, I have never seen I mean by the day five this group, they were out in the woods and holding hands and dancing and they were screaming. They were like three, three year old children playing in the woods. These two movies were like giant mind, like can openers of the mind, where the joy and the glee just came bursting out. It was in there and it just got released. So we've been playing on some movies and we are going to we are going to watch some movies together. And just be prepared, <laughs> because I think your hearts are going to blow open. And our guidance strategy is we're going to work our way through this week. And then some of you, I know this Francis had a, a dream uh, with his five Five or six years ago? Eight years ago. Frances had a dream that she would make a movie, even though she's not a movie maker. And so we have Frances' movie. And we were thinking on the last night, we're going to work up. <laughs> we're going to work, open the heart, soften, expand, expand, expand. And then we're going to work up to what is it, Saturday? Mm -hmm. Saturday night, yeah. So, I think you're really going to enjoy these movies that the Spirit's giving us. And I'll give you the, the setup so that we're so primed to have a, like a really expansive experience with these movies. To me, that's always one of the highlights. I just, I just feel like I'm watching it for the very first time. And I'm feeling all this joy and all these emotions just kind of channeling through me. And so that should be another thing that we'll, we'll use uh, during the week. But you might have to hold on to your hat for that because it's going to, they say Kansas is going bye bye. Okay, so well, many of you actually had a huge day today just to get here. so. We thought we're just going to close today um, with uh, one more song. And then after that, um, we can just go back and settle in and uh, have, yeah, have a relaxing and a restful night. Then tomorrow we, yeah, we'll start, that, that start with the meditation here at 7.30 with Meta and uh, her music. Yeah.